great. And it's really exciting to be here, um, to be here at the, with um, the OSM community and also to have, this is definitely the best view of any conference I've ever attended, so well done. Um, let's see. So I want to begin by actually getting a sense of who's in the room because sadly I had a different commitment than meant I wasn't able to come in till last night. And I want to know a little bit more about all of you. So just to get, get us started and also maybe wake us up a little bit, we'll make a, a little bit of movement. Um, raise your hand if you are a map maker. All right, most of us, great. Raise your hand if you identify as a technologist. All right, a software developer. Great. Designer. Okay. Um, what about those of you who work maybe in public planning? All right. Um, how many of you work for the uh, private sector? Great. Um, what about for some level of government, um, the public sector? Awesome. What about those of you like me who work for nonprofits? Okay, awesome. Um, how many of you work with satellites? Cool. How many of you work with paper maps as well? Awesome. <clears throat> okay, so a little bit about where you come from. And I'm actually going to have you stand up just to further get the energy going in the room. Um, how many of you, yeah, thank you, you're on it. Um, how many of you live here in Boulder? You, stand up. All right. Yay, the hometown crowd. All right. How many of you live elsewhere in Colorado? All right. Um, how many of you traveled here um, from somewhere uh, in the western part of the United States, so west of the Mississippi River? Great. And what about those of you who live on the eastern part of the United States, so east of the Mississippi River? <laughs> Oh, New York in particular wants, to, wants you to know that they're represented. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Um, how many of you live outside of the United States? All right, why don't you shout out some of the places where you came from? All right, I heard British Columbia, Uganda, uh, London, Scotland. Italy, awesome, great. Um, I know there's also a global state of the map, so it's cool, to, it's cool that even here at the U.S. Um, conference that we have some global representation. Um, okay, finally, stand up and cheer if you love maps. Yay! All right, so we all have something in common. That's great. I also love maps. Um, I do have to warn you. So. When I was invited to speak here, I was planning to talk about digital democracy and the work we're doing and some of the really amazing um, map making that our partners are doing, um, primarily in the Amazon rainforest, indigenous communities who we're working to support map their territories and monitor threats like illegal logging and mining and oil pollution. Um, that's at least what I was planning to talk about. But then something happened. So I live in Oakland, California, and um, it's actually not labeled on this map, but it's just south of Berkeley for those of you who don't know it. And over the past two weeks, we've had really devastating fires um, in Northern California, actually throughout California. And even though I live in an urban center, I was still affected by these fires. Um, you can hear it in my voice. Uh, the pollution the, from smoke, not just from trees, but from houses, from chemicals, from burnt automobiles, um, filtered into the Bay Area, and we had really horrible air pollution, um, uh, similar to Beijing, I'm told, and I was wearing an air mask around, but it didn't stop me from losing my voice. I lost my voice, but many people lost their lives. Um, many people lost their houses. Um, I don't even begin to know how wildlife and animals have been affected. Um, and while I was sick and delirious with a fever and worrying about how I was going to show up here and speak to you all, um, I wasn't just thinking about the work we're doing, though I was. I was also thinking about the fact that in Puerto Rico, people are still without power from the hurricanes. Um, I was reading uh, the really brave revelations from mostly women, but also men, about sexual assault and harassment that they've experienced in their lives and this public conversation that's coming out. 
I was reading news about the border wall with Mexico and the you know, increasing animosity towards, um, towards immigrants in this country. And the thing is, this moment feels really urgent to me. And I'm curious if it feels that way to any of you. You can raise your hand or holler out if it does. All right, so there are many of us for whom this moment feels urgent. I think it should feel urgent. The climate is changing, and we're already feeling the effects. Global inequality is rising. In places like San Francisco, so the Bay Area where I live, you have extreme inequality. And I find the mere act of walking down the street in San Francisco, downtown San Francisco, where you have corporate buildings, so much money, and you have homeless people in the street suffering, I find that to be a really painful process. And I, as an individual, don't actually know how to change the lives for the better for the people who live on the streets. But we, as a society, have agreed to accept that. And I don't think that's acceptable. And so I believe that we're at this really urgent moment. And I will still talk about digital democracy and the amazing stuff our partners are up to. But I also want to talk about the broader mapping community that we're a part of here at State of the Map. And I want to go back a little bit historically and talk about how maps helped make the world that we live in now, and talk about, at the present moment, how the maps we're making affect the world that we live in today and tomorrow. So more precisely, what kind of world are we making with our maps? And are we making maps like the future depends on it? Because I believe that it does. So the story I'm going to tell is in four acts, and I'm going to Begin with the bad stuff to get that out of the way. Um, to state it really simply and clearly, because I don't believe it's stated often enough, maps have been used as a tool to enable slavery, genocide, and massive thefts of land. While this history may seem long ago, it may seem like the past, it still impacts the world that we live in today. This is really cheerful morning stuff. Um, so let's begin by exploring how we got here. Um, this is a map of the Americas in 1606. I grew up seeing maps like this, so at first it doesn't seem too crazy. It's kind of exciting, and there's like monsters in the ocean. But it's over time, as I started to learn more about the world and how it was made, that there's something actually really crazy about this map to me, and it's not the sea monsters. It's the fact that this was, we live on a hemisphere that was peopled by incredible civilizations. More than 800 nations and tribes estimated in North America alone that had complex religions, cultures, societal, societal um, rules that were all living together on this land. And yet this map says things like New France and Brazil, which is territory of, of Portugal. And so this map was made by Europeans, and it conveys a European worldview. And already, just, just a little over 100 years after Columbus first landed um, in the Caribbean, it reflects a world that is devoid of, of the native peoples or subjugating them in the lower left corner, um, rather than reflecting the world that was before. So the names given by Europeans who came to conquer the Americas and not the people native to the area. So why is that? Well, I'm curious, how many of you have heard of the doctrine of discovery? Raise your hands really high. Actually, go ahead and stand up because I want to be able to see you. If you've heard of the doctrine of discovery, one person, two people, three people, four. All right, thank you. That's really normal. I only heard about it a couple of years ago, and it was at an indigenous-led workshop in South Dakota. But I think it helps explain a lot. So. The Doctrine of Discovery is um, the name that's been applied to a series of edicts and papal bulls that were written by popes in the 15th century. So they proclaimed the concept of terra nullius, which is the idea of nobody's land. And that enabled European discoverers to invade non-Christian territory. It's a principle that's continued to be used in law regarding land rights to this day to describe territory that can be acquired through occupation. So it's the legal framework that forms the basis for everything about the world around us when we're in the United States anyway. So um, 
again, the really heavy stuff first and then we'll move on. But um, in 1493, um, sorry, in 1452, Pope Nicholas V made the first law that became part of the Doctrine of Discovery. At that time, Portuguese sailors were sailing around the coast of Africa and he wrote into law that they should capture, vanquish, and subdue all pagans and other enemies of Christ to reduce their persons to perpetual slavery and take away their possessions and property. This was further, um, further edified in 1493 when Pope Alexander VI told the Spanish crown, just following Columbus's first landing in, um, in the Caribbean, that we, by the authority of Almighty God, give to you and your heirs forever all islands and mainlands found and to be found, discovered and to be discovered, towards the west and south, from the Arctic Pole to the Antarctic Pole. And we appoint you and your said heirs, lords of them, with full and free power, authority, and jurisdiction of every kind. I think the audacity of that statement is like beyond me to determine that the crown of Spain should be able to go and everything that has been discovered or to be discovered should come under their rule. And yet this is the guideline that has, this, this is the, the beginning of what guided the entire European conquest of the Americas. This doctrine has never been annulled, although there have been many attempts in recent decades. It has been cited in US law um, upheld by the Supreme Court multiple times, most recently in 2005, to justify taking native lands in the United States and ensuring that settlers could have them. So what does this have to do with maps? Well, kind of everything. So let's come here to Colorado. So by the 1870s, by 1871, Congress actually decided to stop recognizing indigenous nations as tribes, as independent tribes and nations, sorry, as independent nations with whom treaties could be signed. At that time, the United States had signed and broken nearly 400 treaties. Colorado became a state in 1886, and as you can see, this map is from 1887. What this map from over 100 years ago reflects is that by that time, the Europeans had already come and turned Colorado into a state in their making. There's some remnants of it. So before I travel to an area, I like to know who they're the indigenous people. And it actually took me a while um, to figure it out for Boulder because it's not on the Wikipedia page for Boulder. I had to go, go searching to the history. But you might recognize the name because there's some street names and there's some area names and there's even a national forest. So the Arapaho people were native to this area of Colorado, and they were displaced by the settlers who came in. Um, they've been displaced to, to small reservations and so on. And so this map, of course, doesn't look too different from Colorado today. The basic lines are the, still the same. And so the maps that we're using and that we build off of are still reflecting a colonial legacy. Here's another example. This is a map of Mexico in 1847, the United States of Mexico. As you might notice, the place where I live was part of Mexico at the time um, in Northern California. Here we have today the proposed border wall. This is um, a graphic, an infographic from Al Jazeera. Um, what I want to call attention to is the way in which that border cuts across native peoples who were native here before Mexico um, as a nation state before the United States existed. And so when we talk actually about immigration and about preventing illegal aliens from crossing the border, we're actually talking often about people who um, by ancestry and birthright are more native here than people like me who are descended from Europeans. And this is just a picture of kind of how that plays out in the real world with, with the border that crosses people who were here much longer before. Okay, so that's the really depressing part of my presentation, but I feel like if we don't understand where these invisible rules come from, we can't change them and we can't make it better. So I'm here today because I actually see a lot of signs of hope and opportunities for decolonizing the way we make maps. And I'm gonna actually, before I talk about some of our partners and the amazing work they're doing, I wanna share some examples of projects that people in this room uh, may be really familiar with. So one project that I love is Map Cabrera. 
and the way in which they took an area that also, I'm looking at Mikkel, um, the way they took an area that was, um, um, Kibera, as probably many of you know, um, the largest slum in Nairobi, Kenya, and it wasn't on the map, so to speak, and worked with young people there, trained them on how to, how to use open street maps so that they could actually map their communities and advocate for services. And then that has now become a vibrant, ongoing project that's more than just a map, it's an information hub. I know you all are surely familiar with the humanitarian open street map team. One of the things I love about them is that it's not just a bunch of, uh, it's not only people from places like the United States you know, volunteering to help people in other places, there's actually a real investment on training people um, on the ground. And so I was in Haiti following the earthquake and we were doing work with women's groups there. And I saw the way that the HOT team was building up a core of Haitian mappers, the people who are the real experts on their territory, helping train them. As you can see, they're still working to this day. This is a recent post of theirs about the recent disasters and the way in which they're activating people. Um, there's another project, uh, Logging Roads, built by the Moabi team. And um, for those of you who don't know, Logging Roads is a bit of a play on words because the tool allows people to log literal roads that are being built, but these are also roads that are built for logging. And as I've learned from working in the Amazon, roads are the primary uh, driver um, uh, correlation of, of deforestation in, in rainforest areas. So where roads get built, deforestation happens, period. Um, they've logged tens of thousands of roads, um, and uh, it's been a really important step in making this issue more visible. I also want to share some stories from one of my new favorite websites, the Decolonial Atlas. Um, we share these a lot on the Digital Democracy Slack thread. Um, I was first introduced to it by Substack, uh, James Halliday, who works with us on some of our projects. Um, so there's actually two types of maps represented in this photo. The, the paper printed one you all will probably can recognize. But the pieces of wood are carvings of the coastline of Kalalit Nunat, also known as Greenland. And what I love about these maps is that they are, uh, they are buoyant, so they can float in the water. So if you drop them, you can pick them up again. You can actually read them in the dark because you can touch them and feel them. Um, and they are representations of the coastline. So uh, the the piece of wood on the left represents the peninsula. As you can see, the piece of wood in the middle correlates to different islands and bays along the coastline, and actually it's a map that you can turn around. And then on the far right, it represents different islands. So sailors, um, the Inuit people would use these while sailing. Is it, who recognizes where this is? Call it out. Yeah, it's the Great Lakes, good job. Um, for those of you who maybe took a moment to, to recognize that, um, the reason is because this map was built um, off of Ashinibe uh, place names, but also worldview. And like many indigenous cultures, rather than orienting towards the north, like we do on most of our maps, they orient towards the east, so where the sun rises. And so this is a map that both turns east to the top of the, the map, um, but also has all of the indigenous names rather than the colonized names for the Great Lakes. And you might actually recognize where some of our place names come from. So Minoaking, Milwaukee, Ottawa, Ottawa, Dakwanikan. Okay, so that sounds nothing like Fort Wayne, but I'm from Indiana and I think the idea that Fort Wayne also means buzz cut hair in the indigenous language is really fantastic. Um, and then Ga Zigogogo Zigogang, <laughs> you can hear where Chicago came from in there, um, but obviously the original place name is much longer. I also think that it's great that the original name for Chicago is Place Abundant with Skunk Grass. So those are some examples of the ways in which you know, different types of mapping can happen. Um, and I'm gonna tell specifically the story of some of our partners who live in Ecuador. So the Warani people are an indigenous people um, that have maintained uh, their lifestyle and religion and worldview despite hundreds of years of the conquistadors coming and um, rubber plantations coming and most recently evangelicals coming, um, to missionaries coming to their territory. Um, 
And this is to orient us. This is where they live. Um, you see South America with Ecuador and the Northwest, and then a pretty large, sizable chunk of the Ecuadorian Amazon that is legally recognized um, as theirs. However, due to things like the doctrine of discovery and the way that has played into laws um, all over the world, they do not have the mineral rights to, to the oil and other things underneath their land. So they have rights to their land, but not what's underneath it. And that, as you can imagine, creates a little bit of a contradiction, because how can you really control your territory if somebody else can come in and claim the rights to what's underneath it? Well, this map is a pretty typical government map. Um, what you see is a lot of green. And what you might imagine is that this means it's you know, virgin forest and not many people are there except for where you see those little dots of villages. And that's actually precisely the problem that the Warani were facing because the government has made their territory available for oil blocks. They already have some oil drilling um, in the eastern part where you can see that red, you might be able to see the kind of red road that extends over there um, along an oil, oil pipeline. Um, but for the most part, they do have a, a um, virgin rainforest that they live in that has been theirs um, you know, for time immemorial. And so they came to us um, with a, through a group called Alianza Sabo. That's one of our core partners. It's a group of four different indigenous nationalities, as well as our, um, our other partners, Amazon Frontlines. It's a group of allies who work in solidarity with indigenous groups in the Amazon and, and Ecuador. And they came to us and said, we've seen the devastating impacts of oil in the eastern part of our territory. We've seen the way that all other indigenous brothers and sisters of ours from other communities have been devastated by oil. We want to be able to continue our way of life, and we know that we need to prevent new oil drilling from coming into our territory. So can you help us create a map? So we began, uh, like we always do with participatory mapping, with sheets of paper, markers, um, everybody gets involved in the process. So the women, children, elders, men, and sometimes they actually needed a lot of paper. This is um, a community at Caro that is quite small. I think there's only eight adults that live in the community, but they ended up needing eight pieces of butcher block paper because they had so much detail about the surrounding areas, the rivers, their hunting paths, the different places that they go, that they needed that much area, even though the actual village itself took about this much area of the land. So I hope what I'm conveying is that these are people who really deeply know their territory in a way that I can really only imagine. So after the paper mapping process to initially identify, well, what's most important for us to document, they then go around with GPS and um, take data. Right now they're using just little booklets we help them create, but we're also working on a mobile data collection app to, work, to use in the future. And they go out and they take the points and they collect testimony and collect stories. So far, um, as multiple villages have been mapped, they've come up with a whole lexicon for what it is that they want to map. And this is just a small sampling of some of the icons that they've created. Um, so they designed these um, you know, hand-drawn and then worked with a designer in Quito to actually create um, digital versions of these. And here's a, another, this is zooming out, a little, uh, some more of the icons. I think overall they have more than 250, so really a huge amount of plants and animals and um, cultural practices and human sites that, that they represent. And then they've also been mapping areas. So this is one of the first communities that was mapped, Nemampare. And as you can see, this is just a zooming in on a much bigger map. But still, the village itself is quite small, but it's the surrounding area. And through this, they've accomplished what they had told us was one of their original goals, which is that they wanted to create a map full of things that were priceless. Because that was the only way they saw to actually have a chance to halt the government coming in and giving their land to the oil companies. When, when the maps show that the territory is empty, it's easy for a government to sell it off. When maps show that actually it's full of things and full of rich knowledge and there's no place that wouldn't be disturbed by oil drilling, it starts to change the equation. So the mapping process is really cool and after multiple months of uh, collecting data and then revising the maps. Um, there are finished products that each village gets. And so as you can see, they have a large map on the wall as well as each household gets to take home a map. And this is the jefe of um, the leader of, of one of the communities. His name is Dika. And he told us, the map will speak to the world 
and show all life that we want to protect and which others have to respect. We can show the map to our neighbors. This map is like a story I can tell to my grandchildren. Through it, they will know the work I have done. And this is another quote. Um, this is Niha Kimantasi, who, um, who was a child when the missionaries first came and the Warani first had contact with the outside world. So he remembers life before contact. And he told us, I remember being a child in the Summer Institute of Linguistics. Evangelists and other people over the past 40 years have talked to us about maps, but they've always been from the outside, other people's ideas about our territory. But I walked for two months to make this map. And when we are in meetings with the government ministries and they show us maps of our land and our communities, I can take out our map and show them how it really is. So something really exciting has come out of this partnership with the Warani, with Alianza Sabo, with many of the other partners that we've worked, out, uh, worked with over the years. And whether or not you knew it, through all of you here in the OpenStreetMap community, and that's that we've built a tool called Mapbeo, or the longer version is how a tool called OpenStreetMap was adapted for communities where there are no roads. So some of you may have heard a little bit about Mapeo, but I'm gonna tell a little bit of the origin story. Um, so this is a community of San Gregorio um, in Chiapas, Mexico. I first went there in 2012 with Skylar Earl, who's, yeah, Skylar. Um, and they'd asked us to come down and do media and mapping training to support them against an imminent threat from the Mexican government um, a, uh, to, to evict them. So the, the Mexican government was threatening to evict this Mayan community um, to move them to a city like they've done to many other jungle communities because they were on a preserve. Um, at the time, we ended up only doing a media training because the community was too wary of mapping coming from outsiders. They'd seen too many times the way outsiders, um, officials, and so on had come in and taken maps and then used those maps to try to justify displacing them. Um, but the trip had a huge influence on me and led me to think more about the importance of mapping indigenous communities and how many groups are dependent on outsiders for mapping support when they really want to be doing it themselves. And that's when I met Gregor McLennan, my colleague who many of you may know. Um, and at the time, he had also come from a map, he come from more of a mapping background working with indigenous groups in the Amazon. And he was also thinking about this question of dependency and how much many of the projects that he was working on were so dependent on him. So we got together, we felt like there's an opportunity here to change this. The technology is, um, is adapting so rapidly that tools that um, weren't even possible a few years ago might be possible to be adapted for remote communities. So we worked on a grant proposal together and ended up getting support from the Night News Challenge and that enabled us to start to work together. So this is going back to San Gregorio in 2014 by that time, we'd built up real trust with them, so they knew that we weren't going to use maps in ways that, um, that weren't in line with their, with their desires and their goals. So they asked us back, and we, as we always do, started with paper maps, and um, the communities drew, community drew really beautiful maps of their territory. Um, but they really, what they really needed was their boundaries mapped, and for that, we knew the best tool would be to use digital tools and create a digital map. But the problem is, they live about a two-day walk from any internet access. So we had to figure out how to do it offline, and we didn't just want to use ArcGIS um, for a lot of reasons, but mostly for ease of use um, and for eventually having a tool that our partners could use themselves. And so uh, Gregor hacked um, ID editor, got it to work offline on his computer. This was a very basic hack, which just like running locally on his computer. And it was amazing to watch as we put a projector up against the community building and the, um, the people who'd been trained in GPS brought their, brought their GPS back and got to see on the big screen how their GPS loaded into, into this app and they got to see it working. And so we got to actually draw the boundary of their, of their community and they realized that they were off in their calculations of how big it actually was, um, which was an important part of their process in talking with the government. And this was really the first example of us using OpenStreetMap tools for, um, for the, the purposes, adapting them to the purposes of our local partners. 
Well, we've come a long way since 2014. We've um, addressed the, the data structure in a totally different way. And this is, um, this is just a screenshot from Mapeo Sabo, um, our partners, Alianza Sabo, um, the, the Warani map and some of the icons that they have and the way that they, we, they've been using ID Editor um, to, to work in their communities. So we're officially um, launching this weekend um, a preview of Mapeo that all of you can download and start to play around and use and break and tell us where the bugs are and help us fix it and make it better. Um, you can go to uh, mapbeo.world um, to find it. Well, we're really excited because this is a tool that has been built um, off of, <coughs> excuse me, off of, um, off of OpenStreetMap, both ID editor as well as the the data approach to the approach to data that the OSM community has. But it's really been adapted for the needs of local communities. And while we're working with communities in the Amazon, we believe that it can be useful to many other places. So what makes Mapeo special is that it works offline. It has a decentralized data structure. So um, so our partners can literally use USB sticks to share data between each other, and there can be asynchronous um, syncing between all of them, uh, and that it's really easy to use. So our partners can adapt it, they can create their own icons, they can create their own, um, their own stories through it. So this didn't come out of a vacuum. Our team is really small, and it, w it wouldn't have been made possible if not for the open source mapping community that is here. Um, I really want to acknowledge that, and especially think Mapbox and um, for building ID editor. Talk about our partners in Peru and Ecuador and Guyana who've been testing these tools with us and helping us figure out ways in which it can work. Um, particularly our partners, Amazon Frontlines and um, Alianza Sabo, and then of course the funding that was um, that was flexible enough to allow us to experiment because we really it took us like four years to get to this point. <coughs> And, and it wouldn't have been possible without the support from, um, from funders who were willing to let us experiment. So if you want to know more about Mapeo, um, of course you can talk to me, but I particularly encourage you to talk to my team members who are in the room. I'm going to have you all stand up, um, Stephen, Alia, and Gregor. Um, so these are some of my colleagues. Um, pictured here is also Aldo, our UX designer, on a recent trip to Ecuador. Um, get in touch with all of us. We all have different areas of expertise on, on Mapeo and how it's um, working. I also want to acknowledge some of the other um, folks who've really contributed to this. So, as I mentioned, Substack, who's worked on a lot of the key architecture of o the OSM peer to peer syncing database. Um, Seth Fitzsimmons, who I think is here but I haven't seen yet. Hey, Seth. Um, and, uh, and our colleague Carissa, who's been doing a lot of front-end design for us, who is on Twitter at OK Distribute, and then also um, the DevC team who's been, um, who've been working with on a lot of different projects and have been helping us figure out a lot of the challenges with OSM peer-to-peer, -peer, the back-end for MapAO, and um, helping us improve it. Um, so to close out, as I said at the beginning, I believe that we're living in a really urgent moment. Um, and I mean this on the environmental front, on the societal front. Never, as a spe never, <coughs> never have we as a species had access to so much knowledge and information, and never have we so urgently needed to apply it to ensure our continued existence. I hope that this presentation has shown some of the ways that maps have been used terribly, and also shown ways in which maps and the people who make them can make the world more just. Everything we make has an impact on the world around us. By making OpenStreetMap open source, for example, from all the contributions of thousands of volunteers, our team has been able to co-create a new form of mapping with our partners in the Amazon. <coughs> and I think this is just the tip of what is possible. Whether tacking on Mapbeo to make it relevant to other use cases, or it's taking other components of the OpenStreetMap ecosystem and applying them to pressing challenges, I want to challenge each of us to consider how we can further adapt and innovate tools so that the maps we make can help shape the future we want to see. Thank you.
Okay, so if you have questions, um, feel free to, we've got two mics. <coughs> Has Mapio thought of mapping uh, problem areas in the United States, such as the Dakotas, and also the creeping menace of urban sprawl, mm. which is taking over affordable housing and replacing it with uh, McMansions. People own two or three or four houses while other people live on the streets. Yeah, thank you for asking. Um, we have been thinking about and very much have a plan for starting to work in the United States. Our, our methodology is very much driven by working directly with local partners. So we have been talking to some indigenous groups in the United States because they have similar um, uh, similar use uh, use cases and needs. A lot of reservations don't have internet access, and so a, a tool that works offline in a distributed fashion makes a lot of sense, and we're trying to explore partnerships there. <coughs> and anybody could take Mapeo and um, and apply it to, to things like urban sprawl or mapping, mapping other things. It may or may not be the right tool for that, and we'd be happy to talk more about that. Um, so it's, it is a tool that um, is very much designed for distributed map making, and and um, I think that's yeah something that you could definitely look into. Yeah, thank you. Uh, hello, good morning from the tree. And uh, now I love your presentation. It's so very amazing. A lot of uh, old map. I'm very good in history, geography, weather, and geology. Everything. I love all different type of map. You have a lot of questions. In the morning, I do not lay my hand. I love work, satellite, paper map, everything. I kind of paper map. Uh, in in uh, Native Indian that have uh, access to the map, how oh, oh, to access to the map in poor country of Mexico. People have no computer. Yeah, yeah, yeah where people have no computer. So the, the in, question, uh, sorry. In uh, tribes, Native tribes. You have to draw on paper map. Yeah, yeah. So we start with paper maps because I th like paper is so accessible, and even people who you know might not be literate or not be might be able to write can still usually draw paper maps, and and so we really believe in that. Um, and then we usually use Mapeo, kind of the second stage of turning the paper maps into digital maps. Uh -huh. Yeah, uh, I know all all paper map it will be can do the map into GIS. Uh, we'll make new oh, map. scanning into GIS. Yeah, we don't do that that much, but I think they're they're really cool initiatives that do that. Yeah. Digitization. Yeah, digitizing and paper maps. Very amazing. Yeah. I have experienced. You've you've it. experienced that. That that's okay. great. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you so much for this inspiring talk. Uh, we've seen a prol proliferation of uh, mobile devices in a lot of parts of the developing world. Uh, is there plans for the future to develop uh, mobile applications uh, similar to Mapeo? Uh, um. Yes, that, thank you for, it's like I planted you because <laughs> I forgot to mention that. <laughs> we, we are working on a, on a mobile version of Mapeo um, for data collection and it's been many years in the making, um, but we are working on that and, um, and we'll, if you go to our web website and sign up for our listserv, which is a very low volume listserv, I think we've sent one email in the past year, um, but we're gonna start doing more and, uh, and we will be kind of sharing news about that as we go along. Mm -hmm. I think we have time for one more question and Emily's running out of voice, I can tell, so. <laughs> Great presentation, thank you very much. Um, are those boundaries um, uploaded into OpenStreetMap for? Also a great question. You're asking all the questions that I should have included in the presentation, this is awesome. Um, so one thing about Mapeo is that um, if the, flex the choice is on our partners. So our partners right now are primarily using it for their own, um, for their own processes and for, sh for just sharing the information internally. However, ultimately, they will get to choose which things get shared with OpenStreetMap and which things don't. So <coughs> Of course, we be really believe in and support open data, um, but when it comes to really marginalized communities, sometimes open data um, can mean actually extracting information from those communities, and so we believe it's really important that they have the ability to choose when and where things get uploaded. Um, 
all of our partners right now are making maps that they're first and foremost using internally, but they plan to share with outsiders. Um, to so, so these are maps that ultimately will be shared with outside world. Yeah. I encourage you to get those maps into at least the boundaries in there, because it's going to bring the point that um, we right now believe there's only three countries that have indigenous lands that are are recognized: United States, Canada, and Australia. I think. So it'd be great to see. Ecuador in there as well. Yeah, there's many there's many countries that have indigenous um, rights recognized. So okay, great, thank you. Okay, uh, I'm going to end with one quote that I realized I forgot to pull up. Um, so this is just on on the idea of indigenous mapping. Um, Bernard Nietzscheman was a was a geographer who worked a lot with indigenous communities and. He first stated, more indigenous territory has been taken through the use of maps, so taken by outsiders, than by guns. Um, but that this assertion has a corollary, that more indigenous territory can be defended and reclaimed by maps than by guns. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, Emily.